Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to look at the general solution to solving first order linear differential equations. And in our previous lesson, we took a look at the linearity principle and the first order linear differential equation of this form, dy dt equals a of ty plus b of t. Um, this has a linear form because of the fact that it's y to the first power. The coefficient of y and the constant term are some functions of t. Perhaps those uh, functions could be constants. If the b of t component, if that piece right there ends up being zero, then we call the equation homogeneous which immediately means that we could solve it using separation of variables um, and non-homogeneous otherwise. So if b of t is anything other than zero, then we would call it non-homogeneous and our linearity principle is something that must be used. The linearity principle or the extended version of it said that given the non-homogeneous ODE and its associated homogeneous reduction where we look at two forms of this equation. We look at it without the b of t term, and we look at it with the b of t term. And we've, we've proved that if y sub h of t is a general solution to the homogeneous reduction, this equation, and y sub p of t is a particular solution to the full on equation, then the general solution is the sum of those two. The powerful uh, result from this is that y sub h is going to contain an arbitrary constant. And that arbitrary constant is really important because it allows us to satisfy initial conditions. Um, y sub p, if we ask ourselves, well, why, why don't we just come up with a solution to this in the first place? Why did we even have to deal with this extra work? Well, that's because the solution that we find is a particular solution, which means that the uh, arbitrary coefficient, if you will, has to take on a specific value in order for it to satisfy the equation. And so this does not come packed with its arbitrary constant, only the homogeneous reduction solution does. Now this is a very important technique because it's it's useful for non-homogeneous ODEs in general, so we'll revisit this quite often. Um, but there is a question that we might have, which is, can we solve the uh, FOLDEs, the folds, in a more simplistic fashion without having to go through all this process? Uh, so before we answer this, there, there is a process that we could go through to try to answer this question and see if we can find some sort of cool mathematical trick that will allow us to solve something in this general form. So we're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, uh, meaning that this method that we're about to derive is something that you might look at and say, well, I wouldn't have known to do that. And the short answer is that, you know, you, in order to do that, you would have to spend kind of countless hours experimenting and thinking about things that you already know about mathematics. So when you see this, just know that somebody didn't come up with this instantly. It took some time. So the first step in this process is let's go ahead and move the a of ty term over to the left. So we're just going to subtract a of ty. And when we re rewrite that, we could write dy dt as y prime um, plus the negative of a of t times y. So all we've done here is just made this look like an addition of a negative term. Now the left-hand side looks a little like the product rule in that uh, recall that the product rule says that if you have two differentiable functions that are multiplied together and you want to take their derivative, you have to take the derivative of the first function, multiply it by the second without taking its derivative, plus the first function without derivative times the second function's derivative, where f and g are both functions of t. The reason we make this observation is because if you take the integral of a derivative by, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the uh, integral of the derivative is going to be the original function. So if you take the derivative of f times g and then you integrate that result, you're going to get f times g back. So that helps us get rid of the derivative, which is exactly what we aim to do when we solve differential equations. If we begin to, begin to match things up a little bit here and we, we try to look for, uh, look for patterns in our sequences, then we can sort of think about this in a number of different ways, but uh, we, we have a y prime here in the first term, which we'll go ahead and think about as the f prime in the 
uh, product rule. Now over here we have y, well y and y prime are just derivatives of one another. Well, y prime is the derivative of y. Um, so here uh, we have our f function. And now we kind of start to see, well, that must mean that if y is f, in that second term, f must multiply g prime. So that would imply that this quantity here has to be g prime. But you can see we're in a little bit of a pickle here because uh, g is missing over on this side. Now, we can't say that g is 1 because if g is 1, then the derivative of 1 is 0 and it will not necessarily be some function of, of time. Therefore, we have to introduce a little bit of a trick here. So to get this to be up in the form f prime g plus f g prime, we're missing some sort of function here. And that function is probably going to be a function of time because g prime is most likely in most applications going to contain a function of time. So when we look back at this, we assumed that a of t could be any function of time, constant or not. So in order to introduce it, the only way that I could get a, a function of time in front of y prime here is by noticing that I'm really off by a factor uh, on that left-hand side. And if such a factor exists, we can multiply both sides by it. Let's suppose that g is equal to some function that we've called mu of t. So this is just a Greek symbol, uh, stands for Greek m. This is mu. And if we multiply by this function, that we don't know what this function is yet, but if we multiply both sides by it here and here, then I've kept the equation in balance. And so now what I'll go ahead and do is I'll distribute that to the two terms inside of the parentheses. And so now you can see that mu of t was distributed into y prime and mu of t multiplied a of t y. And I've just gone ahead and I've written the product here because these are just three things multiplied together. So I'll have mu times a times y, I'll have the negative pulled out front. And then mu of t times b of t here. Now let's go ahead and re-identify our f prime and our g. So f prime, we said was y prime, f therefore would have to be y. Well now uh, the g prime is going to be everything that's in front of that y function, which is this whole thing here, and therefore g must be this thing here. So, you, so now we're going to make the argument that this mu of t, its derivative is this thing called negative mu of t times a of t. So by the reverse product rule, if this is the expansion of the derivative of f times g prime, this whole thing right here is f times g prime, right? Because by the product rule, the, I'm sorry, the, the derivative of f times g. So in order, if, if I know that f times g prime is equal to f prime g plus f g prime. The way in a calculus class we would learn to use this rule is we would take this and convert it into this. That is, we would take the product of two functions and we would want to find the derivative of them, so we would apply this rule. Now the same goes the opposite way. If I have or see an f prime g plus f g prime anywhere, I can replace it with the derivative of its product. Now since f is y, since f is y and g is mu of t by observation or by inspection as we would say, now I can replace this whole left side right here with what it is equal to, which is that expression right there. And oh, um, and then here we're just kind of making that more distinct that these two things are equal to each other. So now in my equation, I am going to replace this whole boxed quantity with y times mu of t. So there it is. And you can see that we've really compacted that left side into this bundle here. And the right hand side remains the same. So the reason we wanted to use this product rule is because now if we take the, so this is another way of writing this, is this is the derivative with respect to t 
of y times mu of t. And so if we integrate that, so here we're going to integrate that with respect to t, what happens with that integral, we have to integrate on both sides with respect to t, is the integral of the derivative just produces the original expression that was in the parentheses, which is this guy here. And so that's what's left over when we integrate a derivative with respect to t. On the right-hand side, unfortunately, we don't know what mu and b are because those are going to vary from problem to problem. So we leave that alone. And you see that now we've eliminated the differential equation. It's no longer a differential equation because we integrated away that derivative. So the last step is to divide both sides by mu of t. And uh, unfortunately, I can't bring that into the integrand. You cannot do this. And the reason is because the integral only involves these two functions. So you can pass constants in and out of an integral, but you cannot pass functions in and out of an integral. Um, so same reason why we can't factor out mu of t is the same reason we can't uh, distribute in 1 over mu of t. So you, yeah, there's unfortunately not a trick here where the mu of t's cancel out. Now, we cannot, yeah, so cancel out the mu of t since 1 needs to be integrated first and the outer factor does not. Now, we have the general solution here, and one would think that this is it, but the problem is that we never figured out how to find mu of t. Uh, that was our big pitfall here, is that we just assumed that there exists this function that works, but we didn't really explain how we were going to find it. But not all is lost, because there is a relationship between uh, g and g prime. So back here, when we uh, made this connection, we said g is mu of t, and g prime is the negative of mu of t times a of t, we just crafted a relationship between these two pieces. So specifically, the derivative of mu has to equal negative mu of t times a of t for this equation to be true. So we're going to make that observation that the derivative of g is equal to g prime. And now we can make our substitutions. We know that g is equal to mu of t. We know that g prime is equal to negative a of t times mu of t. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to rewrite this as, well, the derivative of mu is the same thing as writing d mu dt. And I'm just going to omit the of t notation on the mu just to keep those in, in, in sync. We could do the same thing with a, but they're all functions of time. Now, this is a differential equation. In fact, this is a separable differential equation that allows us to solve for mu. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by mu. Uh, this is like dividing both sides by y when we use separation of variables. And so we get 1 over mu times d mu dt equals negative a of t. Next, we compute the integral of both sides with respect to t. The dt's cancel out and leave us with the integral of 1 over mu d mu equals negative of the integral a of t dt. Now the integral of 1 over mu is the natural log of mu. And unfortunately, we don't know what a of t is. It's going to vary from problem to problem. So we just have to leave this as negative integral of a of t dt. Next, we need to exponentiate both sides. And so this is probably the first time you've ever seen an integral and an exponent, but it's only because we can't calculate it in its closed form without knowing what the a of t function is. And so the natural log cancels here. We get mu equals e to the power, which is in that power, negative integral of a of t dt. Perfect. So we have it. So now we know that to solve a non-homogeneous first order linear differential equation of this form, the solution can be found by the following process. Well, we don't want to just go straight to the solution here because this relies on us being able to plug in mu and b. b we know because that's going to be in our differential equation mu we need to calculate first by using what we just derived. So the first step is calculate mu of t equals e to the negative, negative integral of a of t dt.
Now the key here is that we are not going to have an arbitrary constant. It's not necessary since mu is just a multiplier. When we plug that mu into this, this solution and we do this last integral, that's when we'll, we'll let our final arbitrary constant come out. So it's kind of the same thing or a very similar idea to why we don't write the arbitrary constant on both sides when we use separation of variables. It's simply because we don't want to have to just end up combining those co constants anyway. All right, so let's go ahead and apply this theorem now. So recall that with the linearity principle, we derived the solution in our previous lesson to this differential equation. So we, we looked at it first by taking away the non-homogeneous piece, and then we solved using separation of variables. And then we found any non-trivial um, particular solution to this full-on form. And we did that by moving over the 4y and just observing that it must be the case that y contains um, is something of the form, something e to the negative t. And the reason that is, is because when I take the derivative of an exponential, I'm going to get another exponential with that same exponent. So uh, the reason we had to use a here is because there are two functions being added together, and we don't know what that coefficient is going to be. Um, that's, this is the method of undetermined coefficients. And so when we plug in the, the, the guess for our y, a e to the negative t, and we plug in its derivative, which is negative a e to the negative t for dy dt, we made the observation that if you add these two things together, their coefficients have to add up to 3. So therefore, um, if you combine these two, you get 3a. And 3a has to equal 3, and we found a equals 1. So our particular solution was 1e to the negative t. And the extended linearity principle says that we just need to sum the homogeneous reduction solution and the particular non-homogeneous solution together to get the general solution. So let's go ahead and use the final theorem from above to actually solve this. So our differential equation is dy dt equals 4y, or negative 4y, plus 3 e to the negative t. Now the step one is that we're going to calculate, uh, well first of all, before we, before we get into any solving, the first step is always to identify. Um, so we're saying that this equation, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit, uh, has the template dy dt equals a of t times y plus b of t. So the first step is we're going to need to know what the a of t and the b of t are. So we can see that a of t is whatever is in front of the y. So that's going to be the negative 4 in this context. The b of t is whatever is being added on to that y term, which is 3e to the negative t. So I know that um, a of t is negative 4, b of t is 3e to the negative t. So the first step is to calculate mu of t. And that is e to the negative integral of a of t with respect to t. OK, so a of t is negative 4. So we have the integral e to the negative integral of 4 dt. Now, we're not taking the integral of e to the power of. We're only taking the integral of the exponent. And the integral of a constant is just 4t. So we'll have e to the negative 4t as our integrating factor. So this thing is called the integrating factor. And the reason it's called that is because it's literally a factor in the equation, something we multiplied the entire equation by. So that is called the integrating factor. OK, now in, in Wolfram Alpha, if you were to go about doing this, uh, you could just type in e to this power. I'll show you how. So here in Wolfram Alpha, we would just type in e to the power of, um, and what I like to do now is just type in negative, um, negative in parentheses, integral of, and now the function that I want to integrate, which is 4, uh, negative 4 dt. And I think I forgot a negative 4 back there, but let's go ahead and check this integral out. So if I go ahead and run this, it will not only calculate it for me, but it will also reduce it for me in the event that the uh, there's a, some, sometimes a natural log appears in that exponent when you integrate. And 
uh, the E and the natural log can sometimes cancel out. In this case, um, E to the negative integral of negative 4 dt is e to the 4t, which is uh, what we should have come up with here, but I, I failed to write down that negative 4. So let's go ahead and put that down there. So this will be negative 4 dt, and so therefore the two negatives will cancel, and we'll just be left with e to the 4t. Now step two is just to find the general solution. So notice that we're already kind of uh, making faster progress than we were above. We only have to solve one differential equation. So 1 over mu times the integral of mu times b dt. And so now we can substitute things in. So mu we know is e to the 4t times the integral of mu, which is e to the 4t times b. And b is 3e e to the negative t. Now, uh, this piece here we can do in Wolfram Alpha, this integral, and this is where our arbitrary constant is going to be important now. And no, one important thing to note is that when we integrate this, it's going to be 1 over e to the 4t times whatever the result of that blue box is. So if with the plus c, we are going to have a plus c tacked onto the end here, and that 1 over e to the 4t has to distribute in and will affect that as well. So if we integrate integral of e to the, I'll put this in parentheses, e to the 4t times 3e to the negative t, 3e to the negative t, and I want the integral of that dt. So we'll just double check to make sure that our input looks correct. Uh, one common error here is to put 4t without parentheses, and that causes that t to plop down instead of being in the exponent. So here we were told that after we compute that integral, we'll get e to the 3t plus an arbitrary constant. So that means this will be e to the 3t plus that arbitrary constant. Now we'll go ahead and distribute that in. Um, here we'll have e to the 3t over e to the 4t, and that will give me 1 over e to the uh, positive t when you cancel out the 3t and the 4t. And then here we'll have plus c over e to the 4t. Now we've got to be really careful here. It's tempting to say, well, this is just going to be another arbitrary constant, but it's not because this is an arbitrary constant divided by a function. So you, you can't call that a function. You can't call that a constant. You have to call it a function. And the last thing I'll just go ahead and do here is just to write that y is equal to, and um, to, to remove this from the denominator, I'll just write this as c e to the negative 4t. And I'll write 1 over e to the t as e to the negative t. So there is our general solution. And you can see that that didn't really require a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of difficult work. It was a few steps, but it really was a matter of just copying down what we were integrating. So look at that solution. Look at this solution. We had, we, here we used k e to the negative 4t plus e to the negative t. But you can see that those two are, in fact, the same. So that is good news. We found that that and that are identical. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another example. And really the key here is just to spend the time identifying what the pieces are. So here, uh, if, I, if I want to match the form of a first order differential equation, and not all equations are first order linear, so um, you won't always be able to match this template, but sometimes you have to pick things apart a little bit. Like here I see y over t and not something times y. But if what I do is I just go ahead and separate the y over t as 1 over t times y, now you can see that the a of t is, is just the 1 over t. And here I have plus 3, and so I can identify my parts again as 1 over t and 3. So first step, take the time to do this, because if you don't, it's, it's easy to make a mistake. So step one, let's go ahead and get mu, which is e to the negative integral of a of t dt. 
Now, uh, a of t is the integral of 1 over t dt. And here's the thing, uh, we'll enter this into Wolfram Alpha just to show that you can, it'll simplify it for you. But the integral of 1 over t is the natural log of t. And so what you'll end up with here is e to the negative natural log of t. Here's the problem with this statement. Um, the problem here is that uh, this e to the negative natural log of t, we actually need to, we can't actually just cancel out the natural logs and make this e to the negative t. What we have to do is use the property of exponents of, of logarithms that says that since there's a negative one coefficient out here, um, negative one times the natural log of t is the same thing as the natural log of the argument of natural log to the negative one power. So it's this rule where when you take the natural log of something, you can bring the power down, but you can also bring it back up. So when you do integrate this, this comes out to, uh, the, now the natural logs cancel and you're left with t to the negative one, which is the same thing as one over t. I'm sorry, this is equal to mu. So if we integrate e to the negative integral of 1 over t dt, that should reduce it down to for us to what we calculated, which is 1 over t. Great, and so we have mu, now we're ready to take care of step two, which is to find the general solution. This is going to be y equals one over mu, so one over mu times the integral of mu times b dt. Okay, and so now we can substitute in mu, which is one over one over t times the integral of one over t times b, which is three. And this is dt. I'm not sure what happened over here. All right, so we can compute that integral. This is not a really difficult one to compute if you wanted to do it by hand, but just to emphasize that there's a faster way, integral of 1 over t times 3 dt. And what we'll find is it comes out to 3 natural log of t plus our arbitrary constant. So that's the critical part here is that we have to remember that this whole expression here comes out to 3 natural log of t plus our arbitrary constant. So this coefficient here, it's 1 over 1 over t. So multiplying 1 by the reciprocal of 1 over t will leave us with t over 1. And so now we distribute that in, we'll get uh, 3t natural log of t. Be careful, the t cannot go into the natural log. And then plus ct over here. Great, so there's our general solution. Now step three is to take care of our initial condition. So if we plug in our initial condition that at time zero, y is 10, we get three times zero. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna adjust this just a little bit here. Uh, my initial condition of y of 0 equals 10 is not going to work because the natural log of 0 is undefined. Uh, so actually what would happen in that case is uh, this, this particular function does not have a solution for that initial condition, or at least not using this method. So let's just change uh, y, uh, the initial condition to y of 1 equals 10. This is actually called a boundary value, a uh, boundary condition problem. Um, so we'll have 3 times 1 times the natural log of 1 plus uh, c times 1. And to solve this, we just have to say c equals uh, 3 natural log of 1. Uh, you, can, you can approximate that if you'd like. I'll just go ahead and substitute it into our uh, equation up here. So y equals 3t times the natural log of t plus uh, 3 natural log of 1 times t. And there is our particular solution. Nice, okay, so now we have solved our second differential equation with this. These equations seem somewhat like we're, we're just forcing solution templates. 
But it turns out that homogeneous systems do arise in the real world actually pretty often. Um, but let's consider our, uh, a tank problem where the inflow and outflow rates of water are not the same. Um, so therefore internal volume is changing. So let's consider this particular problem. Instead of using a tank, we'll say we have an oil refinery and this, well, I guess it is a tank. A storage tank contains 2,000 gallons of gasoline that initially has 100 pounds of an additive uh, dissolved in it. In preparation for winter weather, gasoline containing two pounds of additive, additive per gallon is pumped into the tank at a rate, rate of 40 gallons per minute. The well mixed solution is pumped out at a rate of 45 gallons per minute. How much of the additive is in the tank 20 minutes after the pumping process begins? Okay, so we, we clearly want to keep track of the amount of additive in there. We have oil in here, we're adding two pounds per gallon of this additive and the mixture is coming out at 40 gallons per minute. This mixture is that of gasoline and the additive. And so it becomes well mixed inside of this tank and then flows out the bottom at 45 gallons per minute. Um, and we are now going to build that expression. So we're gonna define our variable. So Y equals the amount of the additive in tank after we'll say this is in minutes t minutes uh, this also uh, saves us from having to define t separately uh, we could just say after t minutes and now we know um, now we know exactly what that represents now this um, additive is going to be measured in pounds t is measured in minutes i'll just go ahead and write it out anyway minutes since additive begins entering tank. Okay, and so that means dy dt, as we like to establish, what are the meanings of our units? Well, this is going to be in pounds over minutes. So that's our units. Now what we have coming in is, we already said it's 40 gallons per one minute but two pounds are added to every one gallon of this additive. So every minute we have 80 pounds of the additive coming in. So 80 pounds per one minute. And already that gives me the inflow term. That tells me that this is going to be 80 uh, pounds per minute. That's already in the correct units. Now I'll have a minus term here because I also have my outflow. And on my outflow side, I actually have to think about the fact that I have 45 gallons per one minute coming out, multiplied by how much is inside of that tank. Well, I know that uh, at I know that there are y pounds inside of that tank at any moment, and I know that initially this contains 2,000 gallons. So I know that in terms of my units here, in terms of pounds over gallons, I have Y pounds inside of that tank at any moment. But the problem is I don't have 2,000 gallons at all times. Let's think about this intuitively, what, what's going to happen in terms of my volume. We'll just refer to that as V for a second. So if we look at the time and we look at the volume, inside of this, so we have V gallons. But we don't just wanna put a V there because, well, that's not, that's a third variable. We have Y, V, and T. Now, we know that V is actually gonna change depending on time passing. Well, at time zero, we know that we have 2,000 gallons. Now, over the course of one minute, let's think about what happens. We have the 2,000 gallons from the previous minute We've added 40 gallons from what came in, but we've removed 45 gallons from what came out. So in actuality, what we did is we said we removed five gallons of in net of the total amount of mixed gasoline in there. So we actually only have 1,995 gallons remaining. Okay, so time two, you can imagine again what's gonna happen is now we start off with 1,995, we add 40, 
but we subtract 45. So plus 40 minus 45 is going to give me 1,990. So we can see here that basically this is a linear function, that the volume is decreasing linearly. And so for time t in general, we would have the original 2,000 gallons from the top minus five gallons per minute that are uh, leaving the tank multiplied by how many minutes have passed. So if we do a dimensional analysis on this, what we should notice is that this is gallons minus, this is how many gallons per minute we're losing, multiplied by how many minutes. So in terms of our units, we get gallons minus gallons. So this V of T, V of T we just found equals 2000 minus 5T. So my dy dt, oops, this is not my dy dt, my dy dt is down here, is going to be, uh, this is going to be 45 gallons per one minute multiplied by y pounds per 2000 minus 5t gallons. And that's going to give me the units I need. So now my final equation is 45y over 2,000 minus 5t. And there is that model. Now it might not be immediately evident, but this is a first order linear differential equation. So this is our model right here. And we also know the initial condition. The initial condition is, um, well, let's see initially has 100 pounds of an additive. So this means that y of zero is equal to 100 pounds. And we're ready to solve this differential equation. And in order to do that, we, we want to say, is this separable? And it's not because notice that, that this term contains a t, but this term does not. So it's not as if I could factor this into one term containing t and one term not containing t. If I factor out one over 2000 minus 5t and pull it out front, I'm gonna have to factor that out of an 80 as well. So that means I'm gonna have to divide by one over 2000 minus 5t if I do it that way. But let me go ahead and write the y term first and let me also separate the y from everything else. So if I write this as negative 45 over 2000 minus 5t times y, which is just me factoring out all of this right here, factoring all of that out. Now I can see that this is going to be my a of t. And then I have a positive 80 here that I can put on the end. And so now when I look at the general form of a first order linear differential equation, we can see that we have a perfect match for our method. So we have, first of all, we have that this is a of t, and we have that 80 is our b of t. Now, if this were a minus, by the way, we would have to write this as plus negative 80, just, just a little FYI for the future. We're ready to solve. So to solve, step one, we have to calculate mu. And I'll just write it as mu. You can write mu of t. e to the negative integral of a of t dt, which equals e to the negative integral of negative 45 over 2,000 minus 5t dt. Again, we just have to focus on that integral right there. Um, so let's go ahead and type that into Wolfram Alpha. By the way, the two negatives cancel each other out, so I'll just write the integral of 45 over 2,000 minus 5t. Forty-five over two thousand minus five t, uh, and that's going to be all dt. So let's just make sure that looks correct the way we wanted it to be entered in. And something seems to have caused this a problem. Let's see, e to that might be this. Yeah, it might be that that needs to be in the exponent. And that looks right, e to the integral of 45 over 2,000 minus 5t. 
comes out to uh, 1 over t minus 400 to the ninth. Now the beautiful part here is that it, Wolfram Alpha simplifies everything for us, so we get to focus more on the, uh, on the solving of the differential equation instead of having to worry about doing the integration in addition to everything else. So there we go. So we have that integral written out now. That equals 1 over t minus 400 to the ninth. Okay, so that means step two is to find the general solution, one over mu times the integral of mu times b dt. I'm not really sure why I'm not putting mu of t, and I am on doing it on the, the b of t, but here, just to be consistent, we'll remove that. All right, one over mu, so we have, this is one over one over t minus 400, to the ninth and multiplied by 1 over t minus 400 to the ninth multiplied by our b of t we recall our b of t is 80 so that just in, impacts this by a constant and now we're ready to compute this integral um, the one thing that I will point out is that this is 1 over 1 over which will just be t minus 400 to the ninth and the integral of this and that integral comes out to uh, this, this ugly looking expression here, negative 10 over t minus 400 to the 8. Oh, it's not so bad. And then we have plus our arbitrary constant. All right, so now when we distribute this in, uh, we again, we have to be cautious to make sure we distribute in to both terms within the parentheses. And the first term we see will have t minus 400 to the ninth over t minus 400 to the eighth. And so the power of nine and the power of eight will cancel and we'll just be left with negative t times t minus 400 to the first. So that, uh, nine minus eight is one and the one will end up in the, exp in the numerator. Plus c times t minus 400 to the ninth. And here is our general solution. So now for our initial condition, our initial condition, we said initially there are 100 pounds at time zero and zero minus 400 here to the ninth power. And this gives me 100 equals, this will be 4,000 uh, plus, or I should say rather minus, Oh, we could write it like we could write it like this: negative four hundred to the ninth uh, times c. So negative four hundred to the ninth c times that. Now I'm not actually going to try to calculate this in, in my calculator because negative four hundred to the ninth power is going to be a very sizable number. Um, so to write that out is 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 asking for some trouble to write out too many decimal places. So I'm just going to leave it like that and. This might be a new thing that you're seeing here in order of magnitude. Um, order of magnitude here is very large. So it's sometimes when you have magnitudes that large, it's better just to keep things in exact form. So subtract over 4,000. So it'll give us negative 3,900 equals negative 400 to the ninth times C. And so C is, uh, by the way, since this is to an odd power, this is gonna end up being a negative number. So uh, I can't actually make this negative come out here. If this were an even power, then raising an, a negative number to an even power would produce it, uh, a, a positive number. And you can just check my logic on that if you'd like. So this will be 3,900 over 400 to the ninth power. Now this is very small, very, very small. In fact, it's approximately zero. So it might be tempting to just say, well, since it's pretty much zero, let's just leave it as zero. But I will say, do not round to zero. The reason we don't want to round to zero is because the value of C basically activates this second term. So even though this C value may be extremely small. 
Here we have t minus 400 to the ninth power. So when even when this is really small, and t is, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, well, this number here raised to the ninth power is going to be incredibly large. And if c is really small, but what it's multiplying is incredibly large, this term could still be highly significant, even for a small coefficient. So one thing to be cautious of, do not round things off to 0. Um, do not round arbitrary constants off to 0. So our final solution is y equals negative 10. If I distribute this out, which I can do, um, actually, let me do a couple of things here. c times, so I'll write this term first, c, which is 3,900 over 400 to the ninth, times t minus 400 to the ninth. That's just me writing out this term here with c in its place. And then I'll, I'll distribute this negative 10 through and make this negative 10 t plus 4,000. And I'll leave that right there as my final solution. Now the question we wanted to know is how much will be in there after 20 minutes? So we want to estimate y of 20. Now I'm going to go ahead and type this into decimals just to demonstrate why it's so important that we kept that c value. So, so far I've entered that equation in. And uh, it, here's what's happening. Very interesting stuff. Um, actually, one of the things that we should note, and uh, it, it appears here that this is time in minutes, and this is the additive in pounds, and we see that at some point the additive actually becomes negative, that the amount of additive in the, the uh, gas tank, the additive is increasing over time until it peaks at around 95 minutes, and a total of 2,710 pounds of that additive, but then the amount of additive begins to go down. And that is sort of a curious issue here, but let's go ahead and handle one battle at a time here. Let's go up to time 500. So now we're focusing more on the important piece of, of the graph. Now, the one thing that I wanted to point out is if I took this away and made this zero, Look at how drastically that changed the solution. Look at how drastically our solution changed. It looks like the additive, first of all, starts at 4,000, and it doesn't. It starts at 100. And, uh, whoops, this was 3,900 over 3,900 over 400 to the ninth power. So now you can see that here our initial condition is satisfied. And that tiny constant, which by the way, if you estimate that, comes out to something times 10 to the negative 20. So there's 19 decimal places before the first non-zero number. That's why we left it that way. Now I wanted to estimate how much is left after 20 minutes. And it's 1,347 uh, point. 0 0.0 total pounds. Now another thing I could do here is just type in the ordered pair so I can actually see that on the graph. So there you can see it. That's how much is present after 20 minutes. Now the one thing that we have to remember is the volume of the tank is decreasing, right? So the volume as a function of x, I'll call this the volume function, is 2,000 minus 5x. So that volume function, if you take a look at a table of values for your volume, and we look at the volume over, let's say, uh, time zero, there's 2,000 gallons. Time 10, there's only 1,950. Time 20, time 30, time 40, you can see that the amount of, of gasoline inside of the tank is, is decreasing. So if we went to 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. You can see that at time 400, 400 times 5 is 2,000. 2,000 minus 2,000 is 0. So this is the time. You can see that this is the volume function. The volume inside of that tank is decreasing, and at time 400, we run out of gasoline. And that's why there's no more additive, because additive comes in with the gasoline, and since everything's being drained, 
then there's nothing inside of the tank. So at some point we max we max out, reason being because we're we're still adding more additive than there was, but now the effect of the decreasing volume is causing the amount of additive, the net amount of additive in that tank to go down as well. So that's pretty much it. We can see those are some of the key features of, of this graph. And with that, you can see that we had a very natural application that ended up giving us a non-homogeneous first order linear differential equation that we had to solve now using um, our method. We, we could, of course, have, have done this using the uh, extended linearity principle. The challenge with that would be to come up with our guess. Uh, that function of time here makes it really tricky to do this. When we were dealing with the extended linearity principle, our coefficients here were constants. And because they were constants, it made it easy to form that guess. But since this function may not be a constant, as it, as it isn't here, it makes a lot more sense for us to have derived this general solution method.